welcome to, I think this is the fourth now of these uh, Mind Focus Running Supergroup sessions that we're doing. Um, and they've been really terrific. And we've, we've had some fantastic conversations with different runners um, and different experts, uh, which has been wonderful. Um, and today I'd like to introduce Jane Trumper. And the reason for uh, inviting Jane was <clears throat> we're sort of having a journey runner month and um, introducing a lot of these guys to the concept of journey running. Um, and I thought who better to speak to than Jane because she's the absolute queen and king of journey running definitely in Australia. Um, we just talking about uh, a run for the ages, which um, did on the, the weekend um, and on Sunday night. So this second night, um, Kelly O'Neill was running with me uh, and uh, running the, the path. And on my left, we were running south from Sorrento and on my left was West Coast Drive, which is a reasonably busy road. And all of us and and Kelly was running on my right, and all of a sudden Kelly ducked behind me and, and went to my left. And I thought, I don't I know what's going on here. Um, and yeah, I was doing a terrible lean thing, um, and she was worried about me um, uh, falling onto the road. And that reminded me of another experience that I had in 2015 at Cozzy where, um, and I've told these guys about it, but I, um, I, I'd had a really great race. But again, going up from Charlotte's Pass, I had a bad lean going on and I had people on my left and my right to stop me falling off the mountain. Anyway, um, the reason for, for telling you this is when we, when I went across the, the finish line, Jane was about to start her trip to the summit. And I've never seen a lean, lean like it in my life. It was quite amazing that one, Jane. I, I, how you got up and down is still beyond me. <laughs> it, it wasn't easy. It was worse than giving birth to a 4.2 kilo baby, I can tell you that. <laughs> Um, but um, Jane has, has most definitely been one of my inspirations in terms of running um, and when she ran her Canterbury to Rome journey um, I followed really closely and um, she um, wrote a, a blog which she uh, updated daily um, and yeah I was transfixed and um, it inspired me to start thinking about doing my own sort of thing. Um, and yeah, Canterbury to Rome is still one on the list. Uh, it'd be a great one to do. Um, but as well as that, she's done so many other runs. She's run across the Simpson Desert. She's run the Gib River Road. She's run 1200 kilometers in Japan. She's actually run 369 marathons. Right? Like you, you know, you see, you see these people, you know, achieving the 100 marathon um, milestone, uh, which is pretty special, but 369, that's another level again. Um, and um, in 2017, um, she ran eight marathons in eight days. Is that right, Jane? Um, 20, I think 2019 was probably the biggest I, in August I did 20 marathons I did 10 in the UK and 10 in Italy right so that, that was probably my biggest you know run of marathons my biggest yeah. month yeah but 2017 when you when you did those those eight marathons uh, you ended up at Rottnest and we ran quite a bit of that oh, course okay. together yeah, yeah, that yeah, day yeah. that's mm -hmm. right yeah. Yep, I remember. Yeah, and in, interestingly, there's a there's a, a local guy um, who's running eight marathons in eight days at the moment, um, 
yeah, for um, the Heart Kids uh, charity, which is fantastic. And he also is finishing uh, this weekend at Rottnest. So, um, yeah, I just thought it was a real, real coincidence. Um, but yeah, look, I'm hoping these guys have got some some great questions for you. But I'd like to just start off with perhaps uh, asking you what what started the journey running thing. Um, I was living in Tokyo in 1998. Uh, we were there for five years, and while we were there, my brother had um, a heart attack and needed quadruple bypass surgery at the age of 38. And I didn't like driving and parking the car in Tokyo. So I just started running, walking, doing whatever I could to pretend that I wasn't related to um, my family that was just full of heart disease. Uh, um, and then a, one friend decided that she wanted to run London for her 40th birthday. And so we both bought tickets through a tour operator and she ended up not coming because she had fractures um, stress fractures in a pelvis so I went to London to do my first marathon for my 40th birthday and um, yeah it was a pretty downward spiral from there I got into New York the same year and I thought this is a really cool way of seeing a city um, so that really started the, the marathon journey um, but I, I, I was a fat kid um, and grew up between two incredibly intelligent brothers and to me you know, my life never sort of seemed to amount to much. My parents never thought I'd be good at anything. And I think that's where I thought, well, if I pick running, it's one thing that none of my family have ever done. Um, and that sort of started me off on, I don't know, finding a, a not an image for myself, but just finding a, a sense of belonging. And um, I've, I've picked up a few wacky friends along the way. There's one in the middle at the bottom there. I think his name's George. <laughs> You know, we, 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 you, you just pick up these people and, you know, you, you, just, you just find that you, you're really comfortable, you know, running behind someone and talking to them about absolutely anything um, and knowing that it's, it's really not about, you know, what I do at work or what I do with my family. It's just a totally new belonging that I think I, I needed when I was 40. You know, I, I, I was a mum of three kids. I was a wife. Um, I was a trailing spouse in Tokyo. So, you know, when I found running, it was like, you know, this is, this is mine. This is, this is me. And um, I can do with it what I like. No, terrific, Jane. All right. Um, who'd like to go first? Who's got a question? Just unmute and, uh, and go for it. I'll go. Um, so, Jane, uh, you've given me plenty of advice over the years. Uh, you've told me to stop being a princess plenty of times. That's not going to change. Um, still on the pink top. Uh, I still am, yes. Um, some of the things you have told me I have definitely stuck, um, especially at Yu Yang's, um, where you said I should start at the same speed uh, as I'd like to finish, and I was saying the same, exactly same advice to the people doing the, the loops, the six loops or the eight loops. Um, so yeah, you've, you've definitely given me a, a, a lot, but uh, as, as have a lot of the other, I, I call so-called originals, uh, you know who those are, dog and everyone else. Um, now, is there anything that ultra running has taught you that you've taken to your work life or anything that your work life has um, translated to ultras? Anything in wow. particular? Um, well, I've, I've, I've been an anaesthetic nurse for you know, basically nearly 40 years of my life and running, you know, I've only been doing for the last 20. So I suppose uh, really the... The biggest, I mean, the only advice I say to, to people at work is, you know, if, if you're not happy doing what you're doing, change. And to me, um, you know, I love what I do. I love the people I meet and I love how I run. I'm not competitive. I don't do any speed work. 
uh, you know, it, and to me, what what Rob's doing with the, the mental side of running means more to me than than doing a PB. It's more about getting out there and saying, how am I going to change the way I feel at the end of a run or the end of my day? And to me, the the, the, the biggest issue is what's in your head. It's it's totally in your head. Like you know, I can have a really shitty day at work, and you know, I can turn it around by, you know, thinking about, you know, the sort of people I've looked after, you know, they've got cancer or they've, they've got shocking heart disease and I get out and I go for a run. I think, you know, this is, this is the best I can be to be out there with the elements. You know, my daughter's just had her third baby and she was feeling shitty today. And I said, strap your baby to your chest and go for a walk. It's not raining right now. Just go for a walk. You know, and, and to me, you know, I was stuck in a cardiac theatre, you know, fixing someone's heart and, you know, she was getting upset about this and that. And I thought, you know, you've got your health. You've, you've got everything you could possibly want. You've got three healthy kids. Just strap your kid to your chest and go for a walk. It's the best, the best thing you can ever do. Cool. I've also taken the liberty to um, uh, draw you at Coast to Cozzy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was what the lead looked like. <laughs> I wasn't in a good way. I'm I'm doing one one more. If I get in this year, I'm doing one more, and that is it. That'll be number ten, and that is absolutely it. I'll see you there. Yeah, mate. Well, to come up to Sydney for a holiday and get out of that filthy state of yours. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's next? Jane, since nobody wants to ask questions, I'll, I'll hold the uh, 20 minutes or so. <laughs> I'm interested in the Canterbury um, journey. What made you decide to do that? And what goes into the planning? Because uh, interestingly enough, I know you camped a fair bit, but what was the percentage of camping as opposed to you know some room by the church somewhere? Okay, the, the reason I did it was because one of the doctors I work with walked into the cardiac theatre one morning and he said, hey, Janie, I've just been listening to the radio and someone was talking about the longest holiday they've ever had. And they ran 100 kilometres from somewhere in Italy into the Vatican and it's a part of a, a pilgrim route. I went, oh, where does it start? <laughs> and he was talking about the last 100 k's of the run and I went, okay, so it's like... 2,300 kilometres from England to Rome. It's there, I have to do it. And I, do, I don't know what it was that got into my head about it, but I started researching it. And there wasn't much about it out there. Like it was from like the Archbishop of Canterbury in 950 AD was travelling back from the Vatican on horseback with his credentials from the Vatican. So to it... it when I did it, there was hardly any signage. I got incredibly lost, but I basically started it. I, I'd done a lot of research on what I wanted to carry. Um, and I had my pack down to about six kilos before food and water. And that was with tent, sleeping bag, mat, um, absolutely everything on my back. Um, the only thing I had to get was this pilgrim passport from uh, the UK that basically gives you um, a reason to say, I need to spend a night in a church or this, this really, it's really crappy accommodation, but at least it was a roof over my head. And sometimes there was a PowerPoint, which was great because I could charge my phone or whatever. Um, I really didn't plan where I was gonna be spending the night a lot of the time because I really didn't know where I was. And sometimes it was like 80, 100 Ks between towns. So as long as I knew I could get water, um, I really didn't have an idea of where I was staying. Um, and the only thing, I mean, God, that, that it was 40, 2,300 Ks, 41 days. And I reckon I spent less than $1,000 all up. And that was all on like pilgrim accommodation, um, and food so I reckon probably one night out of every 
three or four I spent with pilgrim accommodation. The rest was in my tent because mm. I had no idea where I was. Like there might have been another 60 Ks before I got to, you know, any sort of civilization. It, and you, you didn't have any problems getting food as you got along along the way, sort of between towns and... Uh, in, in France, it was really um, empty. Like it was, what was it, May, April, May in France. And it was, everything was closed. Like all the shutters in all the little villages were closed and a lot of the, the bakeries were closed. So I, I really had to make sure I had, you know, sort of compact food that I could actually carry. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as soon as, if I saw like a, a car four or some supermarket <laughs> somewhere, I'd, I'd, you know, buy a baguette and I'd just eat yeah. it. Like I, I'd started off at like 54 kilos and I got down to 43. Wow. And, and that was all because I didn't realise just how, how much I was moving. You know, I was carrying the extra probably at times 10 kilos on my back and I really didn't put that into any you know, scientific equation on how much I should eat. And a lot of times I couldn't eat it anyway. So, you know, I got, I got to Rome and I weighed myself and I went, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit skinny. <laughs> yeah. You want to tell the, the guys about the hokas? That was great service. And um... oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 took, I took two pairs of shoes um, with me. And I got to this little town and I took a photo of the bottom of my shoes. They were just shredded. They were just so old and dead. And I just sent it to Roger, who's the hawker rep. And he, he just messaged me like straight away. I said, would you start Costa Cozzi in these shoes? I went, no, but I don't, I, I don't have to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not carrying, you know, I wasn't going to carry four pairs of shoes or three pairs of shoes. Anyway, he said, where are you going to be? in the next couple of nights. And I went, I have no clue. I have no idea where I am right now. Like just, and he, and he just hounded me and hounded me and said, you need new shoes. Where are you going to be? Where are you going to be? So I, I looked at my map and I said, look, I can be in this village at, you know, in, in two nights. And so I sort of, that, that was probably the biggest planning I did was to make sure that I was at that village in two nights. And I was walking down, like, it was like a village of probably, 80, 100 people, it was tiny. And there was this priest walking down the, the middle of the, the little tiny village with two pairs of hocker shoes, like boxes of hockers in his, in his hands. I'm going, oh my God, like, where's he going? And he got to this, this pilgrim accommodation and I'm just sort of following him thinking, oh my God, they can't be for me. And he just handed me these two pairs of hocker shoes and Roger had got the, basically the founders of hocker in, in Japan, in, France to basically send two pairs of shoes to this guy and um, I got them two days later. <laughs> I was very lucky. <laughs> How many Ks do you get out of a pair, Jane? Um, I've got up to about two and a half thousand Ks out of a pair, but um, I won't open my cupboard right now. I've got so many pairs of shoes. It's just ridiculous. And sometimes, and I, you know, I do get them for nothing. But every once in a while, I put them on and all I want to do is wear them out before I even ask for any more. And it's like, I can't wear them out. Like Roger will look at me going, what are you doing in a pair of hockers that are like three years old? And I said, I can't wear this pair out. And I'm just, I'm just, just I'll do anything to wear a pair of shoes. Yeah. And you run in Bondi's, right? Um, Bondi's, I really like the marks too. All right. The last pair of marks were really like I I did um, I've done a, a fair bit of running in the last pair of marks, including a bit of coast some of, a lot of coast to in them. Great. Okay, who else has got a question? And all talk at once. Okay, I will um, have I have one. <laughs> uh, we'll go with Jackie. Um, hi, Jane. I'm a bit of a late comment tonight because I'm in um, Victoria and I thought six o'clock was six o'clock my time, not WA time until I worked it out. Um, I, um, I'm i planning my first multi-day next year um, and I know I've got a few friends who are planning it as well. 
And I guess just what sort of advice would you offer for those, like it's, I'm doing SOS, which is what, uh, 500 Ks over seven days. What's like the best advice you could offer someone doing a multi-day? Never think you're going to win. <laughs> and, I already think that. <laughs> and, and like the, the, first, the first time I ever did two marathons in two days, um, was all because of a guy called Ray James, who was the most amazing mentor for me. I can remember driving down to Fitzroy Falls Marathon and he said, um, Great North Walks on next month. You really should do it with me. And I said, oh, how far is that? And he said, 100 miles. And I said, how far is that? You know, I had no idea that 100 miles was 161 Ks. It never even occurred to me. And he basically said, you have to do it with me. Let's let's do it together. And because he believed in me, I just ticked the hundred mile box and I just went and did it with with him. And I think with with all the multi day stuff, as long as you believe in yourself and you think that you've got the, you can't bullshit your training. And you, you you you've got to know that you can do a long distance one day and another long distance the next day. There's no reason why you have to do it fast. Like there's, there's no, I, I, I'm not sure. Is there a time limit during the day? You've got 24 hours each day. Yeah, just just enjoy it. Like, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I do that's multi-day, I get faster and faster because, you know, you start, as, as George just said, you start off slow. You finish the way you want to, you start the way you want to finish. Mm-hmm. So you never like think you're going to do it. Like, you know, you're not going to do a three-hour marathon the first day so don't or you're not going to do a three-hour marathon the last day so don't start with a three-hour marathon if you think you're going to do a five-hour marathon on the last day start with a five-hour marathon and a lot of the times with those multi marathons I do the first day is usually the slowest mm, okay and then you think okay well I'm going to try and do the same time tomorrow and you end up doing a couple of minutes faster okay I'm going to do the same time tomorrow and you do a couple of minutes faster and I think it's it's it is a totally mental thing where I think women are better at that than men. Like men just think they can go faster and faster, whereas women just plot along and get get the shit done. They, like they're not going to, they don't think that they're going to start doing a four-hour marathon and finish doing a four-hour marathon. They'll think they're going to start with a five-hour marathon and finish with a six-hour marathon. That's good. I'm a plotter, so that suits me well. Yeah, <laughs> Thank g- you. G- girls are really smart. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Peter, thanks for joining us. I know you had some questions. Do you want to go? Yeah, you have to unmute first, though. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, bye, Jane. Um, I was wondering. Um, First of all, like in terms of like the long multi-day events, um, just sort of what volume you um, you sort of build up to when you're leading up to those events in terms of your week weekly volume, and do you do like a lot of back-to-back longer runs, or is it, or do you not change sort of your method of training too much in terms of yeah the multi-stage day events um, and just yeah those long journey runs where you're getting up day after day. And um, I so answer that one first, and then I'll ask the second one. <laughs> I, I think the, the biggest thing with the, the multi state up stuff I do, where I've had everything on my back, the biggest thing is to train with weight on your back. Like you, you can't go out and say, okay, I'm doing a multi day thing and I'm going to be carrying 10 kilos on my back every day. So I'm just going to go for a run. You, you put, put some weight on your back and know that that's what you're going to feel like every day. Um, more than the distance really it's it's knowing that you you can deal with the weight that you've got to carry I, I there was one stage when I was I think I just hit Italy and it was getting hot and I thought my back is just broken and I just took a whole lot of stuff out of my I'd, I'd been through like snow fields and and all the really you know cold area going up through the Grand St Bernard Pass into Italy And I thought, I don't need a lot of this stuff anymore. And I just sent probably three kilos of stuff home, which made it fantastic. Like, you know, I I cut my tracksuit pants to make shorts and thought, you know, I don't need to wear the 
the wintry stuff that I had. So I, I sent it home. But I think the, the, the biggest training advice is don't scrimp on your long runs. And if you're going to be carrying weight, carry it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And um, just reading about your Nepal um, event and how epic that sounds sounded. Um, in all those holy shit, I'm going to die moments that you said you had, oh. um, like how did you deal? How did you deal with those? Like, and not genuinely freeze going, I can't do that. I can't go over that like rickety bridge yeah. where um, whatever a pack horse oh. and killed itself. Oh. You know, have like, you, have you seen those photos? Have you? Yeah, it's oh. insane. Yeah, like there was there was one bridge that was being built and there were these little Nepali guys just weaving bits of string together and putting planks together and they had this this little pot where you, you gave them money before you crossed it. I went, <laughs> no, mate, no. I'll, I'll give you 10 times what I'm going to put in this pot right now if I get to the other end. Yeah. And I got halfway across and there was this donkey arse end up that had fallen down this beside the, the bridge. And I went, this is, this is just horrible. And I, I actually got an award at the end of that run for being the bravest. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, I, I seriously, I, I could have easily have just, just stopped and just bawled and bawled and bawled. There was one day that I got to the finish line and one of the, the guys was there going, oh, isn't that, wasn't that cool? And I just burst into tears. I mean, I just have this absolute fear of heights and bridges, like really badly built bridges. I, you know, I can cross the Sydney Harbour Bridge whenever I like, but some of these bridges were just like non-existent. Um, but, you know, what, when you put yourself in that situation, the last thing you want to do is be the, the you know, the princess that has to be saved so you've just got to get over your fears and, and, and move on. But, um, yeah, that was, I mean, I, I would go back in a heartbeat. I, I absolutely loved Nepal. And I've, I said to all my kids, you know, you, you all have to get there because, you know, there's, there's, there's no phones, there's no internet. There's just absolute love and nature all around you. Yeah, um, but yeah the bridges were shit. <laughs> I love suspension bridges, but I think that might uh, turn my love of suspension yeah. bridges into fear. <laughs> cool. Thank you. I did have a question, which was, what's your favourite country to run in? So would Nepal be the answer? Oh, and Italy. I love the Italians. Like, going from England to Rome, the French were so arrogant and so cold and the further south I went, the warmer people got. It was it was remarkable, you know. Being a single female running through countries, um, I had a few issues with a couple of the guys in France. And when I got into Italy, I had guys wanting to make me coffee. You know, they'd have little pilgrim stickers on their letterboxes, and they'd see you go past, and they'd invite you in for coffee. Uh, they were just, you know, I love Italy. Italy and Nepal, you know, are pretty good. Fantastic. Who's got another one? Uh, Jane, um, quick question. When you are deciding on a challenge or a journey or an event, what's, what sort of criteria do you go through? Do you go just, oh, shit, that looks like fun, I'll have a crack at that? Or is there like a, you know, a, a process or like a, point of elimination or something like that where you would sort of say oh yeah I'm in for that or no not really um I'm I've been really really lucky like Roger the hocker guy was the one that basically said to me you have to run a Simpson desert no female's ever done it so that to me was a real okay how am I going to do that I don't know anyone that wants to drive behind me in a four-wheel drive and he said well just make it work make it happen and I went on to the VKS radio website and the all the four-wheel drive websites. And I found this couple from York near Perth. Um, and Gary just messaged me and said, hey, do you still need someone to support you going through the Simpson Desert? And this husband and wife team met me in Alice Springs. And 
I'd never met them before. They could have cut me into little bits and pieces. They could have done, I don't know what to me. And they supported me for 10 days running 664 kilometers through the Simpson desert. Mm -hmm. So that, to me was the very start of going, oh, okay, what can we do next? You know, they've, they've come to Lara Pinta with me. They've got done Gib River Road with me. We've done Cape to Cape in Western Australia twice. And I've been incredibly lucky to have them um, wanting to do this sort of stuff with me. So if there's an adventure in Australia, it's usually because they want to, you know, support me. With the um, overseas stuff, I think it basically came about. I was I was going to be on a on a team of runners. We're going to run around the world, and the the financing and the logistics just got too hard. So we did um, Toronto to um, New York, and realized just how hard it would be to actually get the logistics happening. And um, I thought, well, I've got to do something if I'm not running around the world. And when I heard about Canterbury to Rome, I thought, okay. Let's see if I can do this. My husband's horrified at what I've done and will always say, for God's sake, get a room or, or you know, you can't do that. You've got to go with a friend now. Um, so I've had some mates, the, the, the pilgrimage in Japan, he said, please take someone with you. So I've sort of, I find these things and then I say, well, if someone really wants to come with me, it has to be someone that I can put up with for a long time. Um, and I, I love doing the stuff on my own because I, I sort of, it makes me feel, you know, I'm 60 years old. It makes me feel strong and, and you know, in there with nature and doing stuff that I've found myself. And I've, I've got a lot of friends that say to me, oh, next time you do that, can I come? Or if, if you've got an adventure, can I come? It's like, how about you find an adventure and I'll come with you? You know, like there's so much stuff out there. There's so much out there and everyone's looking online to find an event and you don't have to find an event you can actually just go out and do stuff yeah. um and you know it's that i think that I, I find that pretty cool that i've actually had the guts to actually get out there and say well you know the the 88 temples in japan is the most amazing route and you know i did that with a mate and we spent zero on accommodation yeah. we slept in disabled toilets we slept you know, on, in bus shelters, we slept anywhere um, and didn't spend a cent on, on accommodation. And, and that after about four days, it became a thing like, okay, we're not allowed to spend any money on accommodation. We've got to go and find, you know, a tree to sleep in or, you know, this or that. And, and it, it's kind of cool, like, you know, getting back into, into nature and saying, you know, we don't need a PowerPoint. We don't need a roof over our heads. We can actually just go and have fun. You'd rather run just a like a journey run or just a, an adventure run rather than an event. Apart from Coast to Cozy. Apart from Coast to Cozy, I think everybody's got Coast to Cozy on their list. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I kind of, I like I like the 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 adventure side of it more. I I I'm not competitive. I I I really don't care about times, and I think that's where you know finding your own adventure and doing it means a lot more to me than, you know, coming first or second or third in a race. Cool, thanks. Cool. <clears throat> Sorry, Jane, just touching on that question um, from Bill. Um, now you've, you've come up with a couple of big adventures through your life and stuff. Um, now, um, have people obviously been supportive, but what happens when someone um says you know you come up with a big idea and you're like I'm doing it and then they're like no you're not or have you done a risk assessment or have you just think about it or wait on it like um how do you handle that do you just say fuck it I'm doing it it's me yeah <laughs> yep you know, um one, one, yeah one of the guys at work said to me when I was talking about the England to Rome and planning that he said, Janie, please don't do it. And I said, why not? He said, I'm worried about your mental health if you don't finish. I went, oh, don't be silly. Like, you know, and, and, and I hadn't even thought about not finishing. Like, it, to me, that, that whole adventure was more about, um, it, it was just a job. Like, 
you go to, you, you get it, you pitch your tent, you go to sleep at night, you wake up in the morning, you pack everything up and you go again. And it, it, I never even thought that I wouldn't finish. And, and, and my husband is the most supportive, patient person in the world, obviously. But um, if, I, if I had my heart set on something, he wouldn't be able to stop me. Um, uh -oh. Awesome. Awesome. And then, okay, so a couple of things. Um, you're obviously stubborn. Uh, you believe in yourself. Um, and you're willing to fail um, uh, in any task that you do, as in you're willing to risk not finishing, um, as I see it. Um, is there anything else you that you see makes a um, person a better ultra long distance type? adventure I call myself an adventureer because it's like an adventurer non-engineer kind of thing but is there anything other qualities that you see um don't don't ignore you know the 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 small stuff don't ignore your feet don't think oh she'll be right and go another 20 k's if there's something wrong fix it um don't train if you're injured like, I mean, I, I could quite happily take a few weeks off knowing that it, it's, it's, it's going to help and hinder. The people that go out and, and bash themselves and, and say, you know, I have to do this run, Why, you know, your knee's hurting. Why are you doing that? Like, I, I, I do listen to my body. I'm a nurse, so I, I sort of I get it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to train when I'm injured. And I'm also not going to ignore advice if I've asked for it. You know, I've got some great guys at work and, you know, one of them will watch me walk down the middle of the theatres on a Monday and I'll say, what did you do on the weekend? Oh, I did this or I did that. Yeah, how are you feeling? I said, good. And another time I'll go up to him and say, there's something wrong with my foot. I don't know what it is. And he said, okay, MRI. And he rings me and says, you've got stress fractures all over your foot. Like, no wonder you couldn't tell me where it hurt. You're in a boot. Okay, I'm in a boot. Can I walk? Yeah, you can walk. How far can I walk? You can walk as far as you like as long as you're in the boot. Two or three weeks later, how many Ks am I? I did about 25 years. He said, I just can't hurt. And I, I'm not going to ignore him because I asked for his advice. You know, there was an, an um, I had a problem with my knee. I'd fallen over. And I was doing seven marathons in the Caribbean. And I showed the, the, the best knee surgeon my MRI. And he said, what the hell have you been doing? And I said, oh, that's a bone bruise. That's really bad. Like, and I said, it's fine when I walk. He said, okay. And then he said, when's your next race? And I said, well, I've got seven in seven. And he said, seven what? I said, seven marathons in seven days in, you know, in the middle of next month. And he said, you walk the first one. If you're not in any pain after walking for 42 k's, you can walk the second one. If you're not in pain after the second one, you can run maybe the first five k's of the next one. And I just I just do as I'm told, and it, it it works. Like you don't ask for advice and don't take it. And if you've got an injury, you 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 deal with it. Yeah. Are you taking notes, George? <laughs> Don't ask some beer. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. <laughs> Who's got another one? Rachel had one earlier. I was going to ask Peter's questions because she wasn't sure if she was going to make it. <laughs> but she's here now. <laughs> I sort of have a, are you going to have a question, Rachel? Um, I sort of, I don't know if it's completely relevant, but how do you know, like, when you're training, if, like, you don't feel like training and whether it's, you feel your body needs a rest or whether you're actually just being lazy and not training because you're, but you can't, you can't actually go out and train, but, but is that making any sense at all? I don't know if you feel if you, 
lazy or if you're not or if you're just like putting off training because you don't want to do it that kind of makes sense yeah um I usually hope, I get pretty upset with myself if it's not a hundred k's a week so if I wake up on a Tuesday morning and I'm not working and I don't feel like doing that I want to go and you know buy banana just bread like, and sit down and Netflix all day <laughs> yeah, just take, go get my grandchildren, go take them to a coffee shop. You know, it doesn't worry me as long as I know I'm doing the longer stuff on the weekend. But, it, I mean, it, it depends on whether you've got a coach or not. I don't have a coach um, and I don't want one because I don't want to be told what to do. Um, but I think if, if you've got a coach and he's telling you to do something, you, you know, you're wasting, you're wasting your money if you don't do it yeah. as you're told. Um, but then again, you know, you, you, you're paying for that. So, you know, if, if I mean, I, I don't need the, the discipline of a coach and I don't want to be told to do speed work because I know that if I do speed work, that's what's going to injure me. And I'm, I've been pretty lucky with injuries, you know, in the last 20 years. Okay, thanks. Who's next? John, did you, I know you had another one. Jane, with, with the with the journey um, preparation, besides the weight stuff, do you, do you up your training, or it doesn't really matter because it's more about the perseverance of it, and so the training's not as critical. The the, the training isn't critical if you've been able to do stuff like that in the past. Like I know my feet are good with the shoes and the socks I wear. Um, I think a lot of the training for Canterbury to Rome was was done online, looking for the best gear um, and the lightest, you know, the lightest mm -hmm. down jacket, the you know, the best solar powered, you know, phone charger, and just silly little things like that. But with the training, you know, as long as I was doing it specific to what I was doing, mm -hmm. um, which was like back to back marathons and carrying carrying weight, like I, I, I swept six foot that year and I carried my pack and you know with everything in it for the 45ks and I thought mm -hmm. you know if, if I can't sweep six foot with 10 kilos on my back how am I going to do you know over 2,000 k's of the real thing and and you know the a, lo a lot of the Canterbury to Rome was going up big hills you know every single village back in 900 AD was up the top of a mountain so it was it was basically training on hills, training on hills, training on hills and carrying weight. And was, was that for months on end, Jane, the carrying the weight? No, probably <laughs> only two months. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, look, I, I, because yeah, I really dislike the weight, so I put it off, you know. <laughs> but finally, there's five weeks to go and it's like, well, you better start doing some training with some weight. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can ignore it for a little while, but, you know, if you really want to, you know, go from a village that's 100 k's away from the next one, you're going to have to carry a bit of weight. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to die because you've got to carry the water. Your, your pack, though, for that Canterbury to Rome run, it looked uh, pretty compact. I mean, like I, I could imagine some people doing that with substantial um, loads of packs than you did. I, I wouldn't use that one again because it didn't have any ventilation in the back and it had no structure to it. I was basically looking for that for that uh, that for that run. I was looking for the lightest pack I could find, and I think I probably outsmarted myself a little bit um, with the Japan one. I had an Osprey which had a proper. Um, structure to it and more sort of more of the weight around my waist whereas the the Canterbury to Rome one was was sweaty um yeah it wasn't a good idea okay does anybody else have a question last one I promise um what's next I don't know if I should tell you oh. <laughs> I, I have 
<laughs> I have every single map of the Hyson Trail. Um, and I was hoping to do that in October last year. And obviously I had to put that on hold. So I really, really want to do the whole of the Hyson. Um, there's a one or two sections where there's a, it's a, there's a long way between um, water and whatever, but um, that's, I, I, I mean, I've, I've put stuff overseas on hold and it's not even worth talking about because I don't know, I'll probably be a hundred before I can do it. But um, the high sin's probably something I really want to get over and done with. And maybe a bit more desert with Gary and Janet. Uh, talking about overseas runs, you haven't done a lot of runs in the States but, and you've got family there. Have you got any thoughts on doing Yeah, I've, I've done a couple or... of, I've done a couple of hundred milers there and I've done, I, I, I used to go over for New York and Boston Marathon every year because um, Sally was living in New York. Uh, they're back now. So oh, wow. um, I've done, I mean, I've done, I've done plenty of marathons over there. Just haven't done any of the. I haven't done any of the big ticket like Western States, rah rah sort of stuff. Um, but a couple of the hundred milers I've done over there have been, you know, very low key, and I kind of like that now. Like especially after um, being involved in the Boston bombings, it sort of put a bit of a bad taste in my mouth, mouth with the big city stuff. I think I kind of like the little, you know, little country towns. Perfect. All right. Well, unless somebody's got a, a final question, I think we're, we're just about out of time. Can I just can ask I, can one I... last question? <laughs> two, two last questions. Is, is, you know, because this group's mainly in the mental preparation and the, and the meditation side of, of running and enjoying that, do you do any of that? In, 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 or oh, it's, it's, it's not an issue for you in terms of these really journey runs you know it's I, I i i definitely don't meditate i i can't I, I, i'm surprised i've sat still for so long talking to you guys but um i think the, the biggest thing i can take away from what i've done is i love keeping myself interesting i i love like having something planned or thinking about what my next thing's going to be and not waiting for someone else to do it for me and I think that's where you, know, you, you, can, you can do a lot of the stuff yourself. You, you, know, you don't have to wait for you know, some event to pop up on Facebook. You can actually say, you know, I haven't been to Mungo National Park. Let's you know, drive out there and, and run parts of it or work out how we can do you know, a multi-stage day or whatever. You don't have to have, you know, no one has to organise this stuff for you. And that, that's where I think, you know, the, the risk assessment and stuff George was talking about. It's like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a project of one and no, one, no one's going to tell me what I can and can't do. And I think that's, that's you know, where, like, the world's getting, you know, into, like, you know, with the, 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 the stuff that's gone down in China you know, with those 21 runners, you know, you never know what's going to happen with, yes. with, our, with, with our sport. And I just think, you know, you know, no one can stop one person from doing what they really, really want to do. No, that's great. Can I ask a non-running question, Jane? Sure. <laughs> Out of left field, just interested because my dad was a cricket administrator. Your, your, yes. your, your brother yes. who passed away had Sir Donald Bradman's um, cap. Does the family still have it? No, he sold it before he died. Oh, okay. Yeah. He, he actually died in 2009 when I was doing um, the North Face 100 kilometre race yeah. um, I got a phone call at the 81k mark to say he died and I, I was just going into a, um, a check or a, like there was an emergency like first aid people just sort mm -hmm. of hanging around and I told them my brother had died and they said oh we can get you to the next you know checkpoint whatever and I went you know he's dead I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going like it was just like you know this this my, my brother was the most the, you know, he, he, he bought that hat after he won a quarter of a million dollars on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he's, he was the most eccentric. I've got two brothers, both incredibly mm -hmm. intelligent, but Tim was just 
eccentric and he just decided he was going to buy Donald Bradman's hat and um, he rang me one night he was living in London and it was like three o'clock in the morning he said I've got the bone of a saint in my hand I'm going what the hell are you talking about Donald Bradman's baggy green and he <laughs> bought this stupid hat and it's just like you've got to be joking but um, yeah but I think he also did that because um, my husband's great uncle was Victor Trumper, oh, who, yeah. Yeah. who is also, you know, he, he was the sort of guy that could never make a six because they didn't have anything such thing as a six when he was playing cricket. It was only five. And um, I think Tim almost did the Donald Bradman thing just to sort of say, well, you know, Trump is not as good as Brad Bradman sort of thing. Yeah, no, it's no longer with us, unfortunately. Okay. Look, uh, thanks so much, Jane. And uh, I know a, a few of uh, these guys were thinking of sort of planning or they've already started planning uh, their own journey runs. And um, if after tonight uh, they don't have significantly more inspiration than they already did, yeah. um, there's something wrong because, yeah, absolutely loved hearing about your adventures and your story. So, Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. I hope you do some exciting stuff. All right. Thanks, Jane. Thank Thanks, you. Jane. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks, Jane. Bye. Bye. All the best. One nurse to another. All the best. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much.